All right, so in this video, we are going to look at some social and cultural changes that took place in Europe due to World War One. <clears throat> so this for those of you keeping track of this stuff, this is chapter 34. Uh, we've already covered the big economic stuff that happened as a result of World War I. That was the Great Depression. What we're going to do here is look at some of the social and cultural changes in Europe as a result of World War I and how these so social and cultural changes led to some political changes as well now i think i've mentioned this before we're going to be kind of looking at europe and then the rest of the world throughout time period six so we're going to look at uh, europe in chapter 34 and how it changed as a result of world war one as we go into chapter 35 we're going to look at the rest of the world so when we hit chapter 35, we'll look at, we'll take a quick look at the rest of the world and how World War I affected them as well. So we're going to look at Europe and then the rest of the world and then come back to Europe and then look at the rest of the world again after World War II. All right, so basically, if we wanna think about this broadly, World War I changed how people viewed society and it really wasn't for the better people really focused on the bad parts of humanity because that's what led to all of this needless death and destruction and suffering. So when people start to examine society and humanity after World War I was over, into the 1920s they don't like what they're seeing and we can see this in a number of different social and cultural arenas so for example if we look at literature and art this period of time is sometimes known as the lost generation so this is the period in the 1920s so it doesn't mean that they're lost like they don't know where they are they're lost in that they are disoriented directionless the war kind of took away everyone's moral compass. So two really important pieces of literature that came out as a result of the suffering of World War I, this one written by an American, A Farewell to Arms, by Ernest Hemingway. Another really important piece of art or literature, you can call it art if you want to, is called All Quiet on the Western Front.
So All Quiet on the Western Front is written by a German guy. His name was Eric Maria Remark. Both of these novels... Both talk about the senselessness of war, which is a big change because prior to World War I, a lot of people believed war to be a good thing. It's like how a forest fire makes the forest stronger. But what both of these artists, Remark and Hemingway, are noting is that war is senseless destruction. It doesn't do anything good. Another thing we can think about when we think about art in the post-World War I era is that photography... change the visual arts. We no longer need painting to depict reality. Photographs are in almost every way better than a painting. So photographs are so much better at depicting reality than a painting is. It's much faster. It's much more detailed. It's absolutely true. There's no subjectivity to a photograph. It's exactly what is there. Which means that painters are now free to depict the world as they see it. not how others want it to be seen. So it gives them a little bit more room to depict art how they want to. So now painting can depict the artist's mind and impressions of an event or a scene and this gives its name to the type of art of this period impressionism and Post-Impressionism. But it's not just in literature and art where we might see how World War I affected society. We can also see it in things like religion. So up to World War I, the ideas of religion of the late 19th and early 20th century was that people were considered Limitless. Remember, this was connected to that idea of humanism. 
that God gave you all of these talents and abilities because God wants you to use them. But World War I showed that by using the talents God gave people, that can lead to a lot of suffering. So instead of focusing on people as limitless and using their abilities to show how great God is, after World War I, religion really focused on the negatives of human nature. And so there was a big focus on something like sin and original sin, that people are by nature evil. And generally, if we think about things like science and progress, as we led up to World War I, everyone was really interested in the next scientific achievement or the next cool invention. As we got into World War I, these things, like the idea that people are limitless, these things resulted in death and destruction. Millions of people died in World War I. Why? Because we had perfected the art of killing people through industrialized weapons. All the stuff that we were kind of banking on, the stuff that made life better, also made life indescribably bad as a result of the war. And if we think even deeper about this, as science progresses, normal people become less able to understand it. And so it kind of becomes a mystery again. So, for example, when we first started talking about science, we were talking about guys like Copernicus and Galileo and Newton. And they are all talking about pretty simple ideas and concepts. So Copernicus, among other things, talked about the sun being at the center of the solar system. That's easy for just about anybody to understand. You may not agree with it, but it's a simple idea. Galileo, again, talked, you know, using the telescope was able to show people, hey, look, there are other moons and planets out in this out in the sky. Newton's ideas of motion, very simple to understand. 
But as we get into the 19th and 20th centuries, science becomes really difficult to understand again. You have to be very well educated to understand a lot of this scientific stuff. So, for instance, someone like Einstein, who was kind of complementing what Newton was talking about. So, if Einstein writes about the theory of relativity, like, I know what it is, kind of. I know that it's got this... It's got this formula in it. I think it's a capital E. And I know what that means. It means energy equals the mass times the speed of light squared. But I don't know what that does for me. I don't understand what that means. And maybe the most perfect example of this is a German scientist named Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg has a, he wrote about this principle called the uncertainty principle. Now, generally, like what it is, is basically that if you look at an atom, you don't know where an electron is. You can either know where an electron is or how fast it's moving, but you can't know both at the same time, which is a relatively simple idea to talk about, but it highlights this idea of uncertainty. And that's what science is now. Science has kind of become a mystery again. And if we don't understand science anymore, is it something that we should really be using? So maybe science and progress are dangerous. And maybe if we want to be safe, safety comes through rejecting these things. And that brings us into some of these new political ideas. So if we want to think about this politically, all of this stuff about science and religion might make us think about how we've progressed politically. So over the 19th century, politics opened up to a lot of people. Another way we could think about that is that governments in Europe became more democratic. More people were able to participate in government. But that also gets connected to World War I. That this idea of opening politics up to more and more people eventually led to World War I. And they're not necessarily wrong about that. Ideas like nationalism became a big political force and nationalism was one of those things that caused the war to start. Another way we could think about this is that Serbian nationalists
assassinated an Austrian Archduke. And that sparked World War I. So including the people in these decisions led to a lot of instability that caused World War I. And so this is going to lead to a type of political thought called totalitarianism. Now, totalitarianism is a form of government in which the government has or tries to exert total control, that's where the total in totalitarian comes from, over people's lives. And we normally associate this with like Nazi Germany, Stalinism and fascism. But one thing that we've got to keep in mind is that this was not simply thought of in places like Germany and the Soviet Union and Italy. This was also something that was seen in the United States, in the United Kingdom. France. So this is not solely something we see in Germany or the Soviet Union or Italy. There were large popular movements to take more control over people's lives all over the Western world. So what we're going to do right now is look at one example of this. So we'll look at this in the Soviet Union. And in our next video, we'll look at the rise of Hitler in Germany and the rise of Mussolini in Italy. And we'll take a look at fascism in our next video. But for right now, I want to take a quick look at Soviet totalitarianism. And you might also see this described as Stalinism. Now, we talked about the Russian revolutions and how after the Russian Civil War, Lenin takes over completely. And it's his job to rebuild the new Soviet Union. After World War One. And so what Lenin does Lenin puts in place what becomes known as the new economic policy. The new economic policy, and they abbreviate this NEP which brings a little bit of capitalism
into the Soviet economy. Now, you might think that that's crazy for somebody as communist as Lenin, but even Marx, the guy who Lenin is basing all of this on, Marx argues that capitalism is good at rebuilding and industrializing but it's bad at protecting workers and Lenin was right and this actively starts to build this starts in 1921 so this works and it starts to rebuild the economy but Lenin suffers a stroke and he dies in 1924. And after a pretty long period of, of party infighting in the Communist Party, in 1928, Joseph Stalin takes over. And Stalin reorganizes the Soviet economy and the Soviet society. So Stalin replaces the new economic policy with five year plans. The new economic policy was something that regular Russians had trouble understanding. We've been fighting against capitalism all this time why are we now bringing capitalism back? So what Stalin did is he replaced it with something that was very easy to understand. These five-year plans are very easy to understand. The idea here being that we're going to set economic targets. For five years from now. And we will always hit them because the Soviet Union is so awesome. And everybody could get behind that. So there were targets for production of uh, weapons, production of electricity, the production of coal and iron. All of this stuff hit or had a target and every five years they always hit their targets now a lot of those targets weren't actually hit the government just said they were hit but this big industrialization process saved the Soviet Union from the Great Depression. 
So the Soviet Union actually grew during the Great Depression, or at least their economy grew. Another big part of Stalin's five-year plans were the collectivization of agriculture, the collectivization of agriculture. Basically, instead of giving farmers their own piece of land, we're going to take all of the land and have all the farmers work on it. So we're going to have giant collective farms. This was something that Lenin didn't do. He gave the farmers control of their own land and Stalin turns around and says, no, we're going to take all the land and you can work on it, but you don't get to own the land. The government owns the land. And a lot of farmers opposed this. You know, this is something that Lenin promised us and we don't want you taking it away from us. This leads into the second big piece of Stalinism and these are the great purges. So like in the French Revolution, anyone who opposed what Stalin was doing like these farmers could be arrested and either executed or forced to work on these industrial projects. And these big prison camps called gulags. So this kind of forms the basis of Stalinist society that we are so awesome and we're going to do this very simple goal. We're going to hit these targets and if you don't like it, you're going to be arrested and either executed or forced to work on these big projects. There's no room for the people in this. Stalin makes decisions and the people have to follow them. It's not good, but based on the context in which this is happening, in which the people are seen as a destabilizing force, it makes sense in the context in which it happened. All right, so we're going to stop there. In our next video, we'll talk about what happened to Germany after World War I, and we'll talk about the rise of fascism and Hitler. So that'll be in our next video. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.